Thank you. Thank you all. Let's see if this works. Yes. Delightful to be back. Uh, my first time with this tribe, which at the time seemed like a tribe that I don't know if I want to belong to, uh, <laughs> was in Berlin, what, six years ago or so. And uh, my deepest gratitude to all of you and all of those members of the tribe not here, because applied improvisation has genuinely changed my life, and not just my professional life. Uh, we are going to see over the coming 50 minutes or so a taste of how what I and my colleagues have learned from the Applied Improvisation Network has fed into our other explorations and how we're now trying to use in particular humor as a way to harness the power of humanity and to try to accomplish things that are not easy to accomplish. So a little bit of background, you heard too many words. In short, I'm a, a math geek. I'm a scientist who became a humanitarian worker. Unfortunately for the planet, we have a lot of work. Things are happening, too much is changing, and there are situations where knowledge can become action, but it doesn't always happen. Any advice on that? Ready to go? Uh, this may work. So far, Michael has been genius in making first? everything work. You want the audio first? No, let's go for the PowerPoint. Thank you. Exposing the nature of collaboration is something that often we're told that is bad. Everything is supposed to work like a mechanism, and as a presenter, I am told you shouldn't be talking to the expert who pushes buttons that I would never know how to push because I've messed up. That is one of the things f foundational to what I've learned about the world and professional work with applied improvisation. This is how work happens. Thank you, Michael. How often do we say thank you to the person who helps us do what we do? So this is my team. We're a global team based in the Netherlands, but we serve 191 countries. We help anticipate and address humanitarian consequences of things that can go wrong with climate-related things, from tomorrow hurricanes uh, to long-term sea level rise. Uh, these are uh, charming photos. There are other photos that are difficult to coexist with. Um, it may look like a normal day, and in a way it is if you recognize that a new normal is very similar to what we used to call bad. <laughs> now, I warn you, I celebrate your laughter, but this is not a session where I try to make you laugh. This is not a stand-up comedy routine based on jokes Jokes are statements that are meant to provoke laughter. If it happens, please laugh. But this is not about that. This is about how humor can help us notice what we don't often notice. As a math geek, let me tell you how this cartoon beautifully illustrates what, in my opinion, is the, the foundational similarity between humor and humanitarian work. Both are about the clash between what is and what could be. So, in this graph, it shows that change can often happen gradually until it happens abruptly. As a math geek, I can anticipate H. <laughs> H represents how horrible can things get <laughs> once they start changing fast. Now, D stands for denial. Do we dare recognize that we fail to notice the obvious. Time is coming. We can estimate how much time between now and some abrupt change coming. And there's all sorts of other things. Are we willing to take the leap into action to help those who may be in trouble? Most important question, what on earth were those people thinking about? Why are we socially constructing risk? That causal mechanism behind everything that looks stupid, but is real, is what we need to confront, as well as dealing with the imminent of needs. Now, this is the original caption by Bob Mann. 
we've got to talk. Well, let, guess what? Conversation is an art form that has been lost to contemporary modes of interaction. The dominant modality of interaction is unidirectional. You shut up and listen, I'm the boss, I'm talking, or I'm some presenter, I'm talking. And when we get people together, except for applied improvisers and a handful of others, we don't know exactly how to go about, we've got to talk. So everyone stand up, find a partner, silently, stand back to back with your partner if you can. In silence, please. It's gonna be trouble, I promise. If you don't have a partner, f uh, uh, form a trio, bump your way into shoulder to shoulder. Okay, thank you, very important. No talking to your partner, because otherwise you can do things that are not to be done, like agree on what to do. In this game, you cannot agree on what to do. Are you familiar with the game of rock, paper, scissors? Yes. Can you all show me your rock? It's just a fist, but it represents something else. Show me your scissors, show me your paper, good. In the normal game of rock, paper, scissors, the rock is trying to demolish the scissor. The scissor is trying to cut the paper. It's a competitive game where my only way of winning is to destroy you. We're going to play a different version of the game. It's a collaborative version of the game. When no talking, when I say, ready, set, go, you both turn around as agilely as you can, and do one of those three gestures. If you match, you shout yes. Otherwise, you stay silent and you go back to back to back for the second round. <laughs> Try to match your partner. What will he or she do? Ready, set, go. Yeah! Yeah! Now, yeah! Go back to back to back. Go back. You're going to say one word. That word is a word that you associate with both humor and the Red Cross. No strategizing. What do you think of that can be thought about that is involving humor and the Red Cross? It has to be only one word. What are you going to say? Ready, set, go. <laughs> associate with humanitarian work on the Red Cross? <laughs> it doesn't, well, smart, thank you very much. Uh, you haven't seen all of my work, you may take that back. But in any case, this is what we associate with humor, and it seems completely unoverlapping with the nature of our work. Did anybody think of the word death? Someone did. When I played this game with Bob Mankoff, the creator of that cartoon, we both went like that, I said something, and he looked at me in the eye, and he said, death. <laughs> Guess what? Think of that cartoon of the waterfall. In order to create that cartoon, which is the first one he thought of when I told him I'm working about risk, I'd like to explore humor. Thank you, Drew, by the way. Where are you, Drew? Thank you, Drew, for the bridge. Uh, and I'll talk about Drew later as well. He draws on the possibility of death in order to create humor. That's perplexing. Now, I cannot make jokes about death as a humanitarian worker. That would be completely inappropriate. But there are things that humor can do. 
outside of my Red Cross life, I was consulting for a team of the World Bank Group that was going to bring together 150 people from ministries of finance, ministry of planning, ministry of infrastructure, entities from national governments that received billions of dollars to build dams and ports and so on. The conversation was to be about government accountability, could be interpreted as code for corruption, and citizen engagement, which could be assumed to be let those losers lose. How do you bring someone who is receiving your money to have a conversation about things like corruption and so on? Most natural reaction on the part of a minister from my home country would be, there is no corruption in my country, it wasn't me, and who are you to bring that topic? Yeah? So to have that conversation, you need to create something different. What we proposed with Bob Bankoff and myself was to create a humor-enabled conversation. We curated some cartoons, were printed this large uh, against the walls, and people were invited to walk around, have a conversation if something struck their uh, vibes. There was a lot of laughter in the room because they recognized the reality that was being made fun of. And then they started a conversation and they annotated the cartoons. And a lot of things emerged and then it was easier to have that conversation. And you can see there's from deep reflection to recognition of that. <laughs> As a scientist communicating forecasts about tomorrow's extreme rainfall or seasonal drought or sea level rise to people who could make decisions, this is how it feels. It's like we are honking and honking again about what should be listened to and isn't. Guess what, if I keep honking again the same way, it won't work. Um, I am positing that the emergence of humor enables breakthroughs in understanding, in dialogue, in recognition of realities. The applied improvisation tribe is aware of that but as far as I can tell, with a few exceptions, is not thinking of humor as a central tool to accomplish certain serious things. Let me uh, get there shortly. First of all, we don't know what, thinking, what people are thinking when they come to some event. And if you're a disaster manager, chances are they're not thinking about what you think they're thinking. <laughs> this is another cartoon by Bob Manko. I see risk as, oh, it can go wrong, yo, know, the floodplain, you make it flooded. A farmer in Zambia is thinking, oh yeah, the floodplain, it's fertile soil. That's where my crops will grow faster and richer. How can I anticipate what people are thinking about? How can I converse about our differences? This, my friends, is a photo of one of the last 16 consecutive conferences I have attended of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. UN Climate Conference. Two weeks from one Monday to weekend the other Friday. 10,000 people from 200 countries trying to fix one of the most complex problems we're confronting. Two weeks of that, who would like to go? <laughs> How much humor do you think there is in that room? If you think of the occasional conference as having death by PowerPoint, in this context, there are real consequences to the idea of boredom. Every brain that is checking email or not engaged is not finding the solution that we need. See that fellow over there? <laughs> You're laughing, but that's exactly how it feels. That's exactly how I feel when I go places to try to understand the science, the policy, the governance, the funding, the absence of funding, the everything that is in there. I'm like, you know, there's, this is not a, oh, there's, there's a storm going on. There's a hell brewing. Now I'm going to tell you a story that happened uh, three or four years ago in one of these UN climate conferences, I have my laptop, couldn't connect to the internet, and like Michael, who was nearby and he just pushed some buttons, I have to go to the IT desk. And I went to the IT desk and two nice young men were pushing buttons to fix my computer, and one of them looks at their own computer, says something in a language I don't understand, and they both have a nice laptop. 
I have no idea what was going on. I have nothing else to do. So I said, uh, would you mind sharing what is uh, humorous? And one of them said, sure, yeah, a PowerPoint just started in room 17. <laughs> <laughs> like, I have no idea how they know that or why that is funny in noticing my facial expression of confusion. Uh, he elaborated, well, we can see a peak in internet consumption. <laughs> so, this, this is a very important moment, right? Many of you burst into laughter. Some of you took a while to understand it. One face I'm seeing is still in a, in a complete state of shock. <laughs> I have continued to have that state of shock. This was the first moment I can trace where humor was a diagnostic tool. Wait a second. Why is that funny if it is appalling? <laughs> we are designing events that seem to be designed intentionally to make people tune out of the time when we bring them together. Of course, the word needs more applied improvisation and other forms of interaction, but this to me if this is funny, then humor is more complicated than we think. Uh, these are two of the works of art that I think of when I think of my current work. Uh, we have been creating creations that ended up becoming monsters, in part because of la our lack of caring, whether it's the internal combustion engine or the UN climate conference systems. And it really feels like screaming. When I go work with my colleague, Kara, Kara, can you stand up and wave? Kara is a real Red Cross person, not like me. No. I do, yes. <laughs> I'm in charge of research and innovation. I think I come up with ideas. Kara has to help set up systems that make decisions as to where to spend the money, which is also the mirror image were not to spend the money. Two places need money, you only can afford one. So please talk to her, she needs your help. Um, so this is how our work feels in the humanitarian sector. Talking about humor, I am envisioning as humor can be useful if certain things are in place, certain things happen, I don't understand very well, let's try. What I do not want is what is often told to people who are about to start a PowerPoint, which is, start with a joke. Yeah? <laughs> this is from the cover of a book by Ross Chast. I hate the guts of those who bring a, oh, but take it lightly, here's something funny, let's all do something. I once invited a colleague from the side of the Red Cross that deals with conflict, with armed conflict, really severely damaging to the soul work. And I said, Marsha, if you'd like to come, there's a workshop about humor and humanitarian work. And she replied in email, all caps, no, I don't want to be asked to quack like a duck. <laughs> Who made her do that? <laughs> Someone thought, let's inject humor in a workshop for humanitarians dealing with our conflict. Let's ask them to quack like a duck. I don't want that. But it's hard to tell which is the line that shall not be. These are some of the examples of what we have been doing in my team, the Red Cross, Red Cross and Climate Center, always with partners. This is in the eastern Namibia on the Zambezi River floodplain. Farmers were learning about flood predictions, flood forecasts, and we have discussed what can you do about it. You can take your children to high ground, you can you know, do certain things that protect your loved ones and your assets, and then we play the game where they actually have to do it. If this were about a uh, fire risk, you would have to go and run to the fire extinguisher. Guess what? That's when you notice that you don't know where the fire extinguisher is. Yeah? Now, if you look at the body language, they're really going for it. But look at their faces. They're having a blast. Neuroscience shows that when humor happens, memories that are formed stay longer and deeper and more entrenched, and they're easier to access. That matters when the next flood forecast comes.
You know how hot it gets. I have no doubt that these flash mobs save lives. Because now they know that they have to stay hydrated, they have to seek shelter. They have to request a revision of their working conditions when it gets 125 degrees and so on. Uh, last example for now, I was one of two training NASA on how to communicate science, satellite images, etc., to, to help make decisions on disaster preparedness. And uh, Andrew had this brilliant idea. He saw that the, the first event was in a, like a local pub, that, and it had the aesthetics of a stand-up comedy club. Right? So what we did was, and what was going to happen here is, Team A from NASA comes and talks about their satellite tool. Team B comes and talks about their modeling. And then everyone is somewhat bored, and then nothing happens. Their problem is that they have all these tools that no one is using to save lives. I kind of know why. Some of them are too complex. Some of them are not exactly useful. And most of them need a process of working with others to become embedded in systems. So what we did was each team has five minutes to present their tool, their program, etc. Everyone else in their tables, they have to come up with two headlines of an imaginary future where something happens involving that tool. Could be something good that was done because of that. Could be something bad that happened that could have avoided because of this tool. Or could have been a, a misinterpretation of the use or an intentional bad use, etc. Guess what? Everyone latched onto the bad news. The headlines were hilarious. And it was an easy way to communicate to their colleagues, you're missing the big picture. You're not understanding how things really work. You're not noticing that someone is not going to get it. To say that to your professional colleague can be difficult. But if humor is in the room, it becomes much more possible. So humor was not a joke. It was the creation of an atmosphere that enabled humor to emerge. And laughter is the shortest distance between people and ideas, especially when things can be not right. Um, that's a sentence from the official uh, TED Talk guidelines, essentially saying when the audience laughs with you, they like you, they trust more of what you have to say, and they take it more seriously. Uh, if you want, there's a TED Talk I gave a couple of months ago on this humor and humanitarian work. So I'm going to skip this because you took too long when I gave you time. <laughs> Punishment. Very unfair. But uh, let's do this. 30 seconds of silence or less. Can you think of instances in your recent or long ago life when something was happening, then humor happened, someone said something light, someone fell all over a banana peel, I don't know, and as a result there was a change in the dynamics. Think of it. So it helps me move to the next. You have 15 seconds or less in silence. And either you thought of something or you didn't, I'm going to cut you short. <laughs> so these are the words that most people think of when thinking of humor. But I've been spending some time with people who are professional makers of humor. And I asked them, what do you think of when you think of humor? And here are some of their words. Conflict, tension, risk, ambiguity, confusion, questioning, danger, contradiction, of course, death, ambiguity. These are exactly the reasons why we humanitarians have too much work. And therefore, it's like, ah! Oh, we can use humor to show the causes and consequences of things like too much tension, too much danger, too much contradiction. Contradiction between a federal law and a state law can mean trouble. Yeah? Um, I have the audio, but for the benefit of speed, because I'm sure time is flying, yes. I often get told, oh, but you cannot use humor because our work is too serious. And it turns out that uh, Mahatma Gandhi was a very intelligent, tactical, and strategic user of humor. And so was Martin Luther King, his student. Uh, in an audio that I have that has his very charming, uh, you call it what, role? To me, the, the southern accent? He says, you've got to have the ability to engage in creative laughter in order to live amid difficulties and tension. If you can't laugh in life, you're a very miserable human being. 
A great deal of truth often comes through laughter. Some people have developed the talent to get this truth over to many people by laughing the truth into them and out of them. Isn't that awesome? How, how can you elicit tough realities? Maybe for sure. I think humor is most important, he says, in getting at truth, getting people to understand and often to rise above the despair which can surround them. Now, he was surrounded by despair. He was being jailed for something as normal as saying, hey, my pigmentation shouldn't determine whether or not I can drink water and thirst. No one can tell me that his work was not serious. But humor really did help, and I can share phenomenal anecdotes from him and Gandhi and many others. But I want to point to one thing here. We think of people as if they were born funny. But it's developing the talent to get this truth. One example, he was on a car with some of his peers on a way to a place to stage a protest that was most likely going to get them to jail. He said, we're late, but let's stop get a sandwich because we do not like the idea of spending the night in prison while hungry. He, the wording was more humorous than what I just said. <laughs> but he was using humor to speak about a difficult truth. If we're doing this, we have to accept a possible consequence that is not of our life. When I last stood on a stage uh, with the AN conference, I think it was two years ago in Montreal, I showed this of the places where I had already done AIN things. Uh, so these are places where I run activities. Uh, Uganda, Kenya, uh, Zambia, Southern Africa, Mali, Ghana, uh, Delhi, Fiji, Guatemala. Since then, I've had some more work. So, Kathmandu, Singapore, Borneo, Vanuatu, uh, you name it, Mali, Mopti. Um, unfortunately for the world, we have too much work. Please connect to Kara. Can you rise again, Kara, and show who you are? She can help. She is here not working in Geneva for the Red Cross, so uh, four days or something, that she could be doing things like allocating money for people who are hungry. She's here. She better get something good out of this. Okay? <laughs> And you can help us imagine how we can bring, because you're talking of these conferences beyond borders, but with a few exceptions, some I recognize and some not, there is a vast majority of Europe, North America here. And the world that needs you is predominantly elsewhere. So if this is the world conference, let's bring the world to the AIN. It doesn't, not, it doesn't have to be that you go to Kathmandu after the earthquake, but it can be that you help others. <sighs> that was my tough point. Um, He's so awesome. I know you will meet him one day. He has to come to one's future uh, AM. But thanks for trying. We need to try harder. Moving on. Thank you, Melina. Uh, I went through her sustainable stand up comedy training in Singapore. And one thing I really liked about her, the mindset she put together stand up comedy is assumed to be making fun of those from another political flavor, from another ethnic group, from another something or other, or making fun of self. I'm so told that this guy doesn't fit in economic class, I don't like flying, but I have to. And then people may laugh. And it's sad because they're laughing about my suffering, which is a lot of stand-up comedy. Yeah? 
What she says is, love yourself, love your neighbors, find the system in fact. How can we shed light on things about what is around us that shouldn't be that way? And use humor to say, well, something's there, it shouldn't be there, let's check it. Now I'm going to get geeky. Some of you attended the data session today. Thanks for trying to bring analytical rigor uh, to this tribe. We need more of that. Please bear with me. I promise you it's good. <laughs> Let me make sure I don't trespass on the timing. Oh, we're so fine. <laughs> so, I work with teams at MIT Media Lab. I was walking around. There was a big screen on the fourth floor, which I couldn't see what it was showing. As I get closer, it shows the place where I am, including me and Jano. Ja greetings from Jano, for those of you who know her. And then, my face changed into a, an emoticon. And as I saw that, I frowned, and the emoticon frowned. Which made me laugh, and the emoticon laughed. Turns out this team, the Affective Computing Team, has developed a tool that can read your facial expression. Eyebrows go up, surprise. Lips curl up, uh, humor, etc. And then you can tell, are you like uh, whatever? Are you different shades of happy or joy? Or are you sad, angry, asleep? Very calculable if you think of the things computers can do. If it sees you, it can notice certain things. I was going to have to give a talk about climate problems, including geoengineering. Has anyone heard about geoengineering? OK. I have bad news for you. The climate is changing so fast that there is a proposal to intentionally modify the global climate by blocking sunlight with sulfuric particles. OK? This is a reality. Now I'm going to explain what's going on here. I'll, I'll, I'll repeat it. But yes, thanks for your curiosity. So, five days of global Red Cross youth convening in northern Italy. Last day after lunch, I get given one hour. Guess what? The girl from Uruguay and the kid from Tajikistan are more interested in each other than they're listening to the old dude talking about. Yeah? So how can I try to get them to listen? Because this should matter to them. They're young humanitarians who will experience a complicated future. This is an actual shot from my session. This is what I knew was going to be the default. Yeah? Some are completely distracted. Some are looking elsewhere. Uh, you don't see the ones that are asleep. I didn't there. I was over here, by the way. None of them is looking at me. But what I needed was for them to be looking at me and noticing what I was about to say. So with their consent, and with the MIT offshoot, et cetera, machine learning, analysis of facial expressions, we talked about, I'm going to get to you now, solar radiation management. Can we manage how much sunlight comes to us? Can we block some? This is something I wanted to tell them. And I, I knew it was going to be hard, so I said, how can I, can I try to use humor? Can I try to use humor? And I reached out to Drew Darwin, who is a professional humor that works, who explains to people how humor can help them. Whether you're IBM or FBI, he can help you. So he kindly offered to help me without charging me what he charges those other guys. And he said, I predict, sorry, he suggested that I use Mary Poppins. I'll explain why very shortly. But I said to dear Drew, dear Drew, thanks for your service, but I think it's not good because a global event, many people from Tajikistan may not know who Mary Poppins was, Youth, this was before the remake. Uh, uh, and third, and most importantly, I don't like Mary Poppins. <laughs> and he said, well, you do as you want, but I predict that if you use Mary Poppins, people will get it, people will be engaged, people will get the point you're trying to convey. What better way to lure a geek into doing that than to make a prediction that is testable? <laughs> I formulated a hypothesis, I got the gear, I got the consent and all that stuff, and uh, this was the first that I know geoengineering session that was designed with humor in mind, and it was tested. The machine reads facials and recognizes that a face or not. And if it's a face, it can measure lots of things, including are you engaged or not? Are you with it or not? That's the red line. Not much engagement going on there. Surprise, do eyebrows go up? 
and joy. Is there, you know, all those metrics of the lips and so on that is uh, laughing and so on. Okay. So this is what the computer was saying. Now I'm going to show you the moment that matters. This is where the kids were when Pablo was saying, there are people who are positing, and it is very obviously true based on science, that we can technologically manipulate the global climate by messing with the atmosphere intentionally. They engaged a little bit, and as I continued speaking, I began to lose everything. One way is to suck carbon from the atmosphere, just like trees do, but with machines. And some of them may have been surprised by these machines that suck. The other way is to intentionally block sunlight. Imagine a giant umbrella between us and the sun. Now I got their attention. Here's Drew's magic at work, yeah? They're saying, what the hell are you talking about? They're engaged and they're surprised or confused. It's like having a giant Mary Poppins in the sky. <laughs> because I, what I had explained was to block sunlight with a... So instead of one giant... Um, oh, sorry, I, I'm messing up, I'm tired. When I said giant umbrella in the sky, they're surprised. When I say Mary Poppins in the sky, surprise goes down, joy goes off the ship. Yeah. They're having a blast. Yeah? Engagement goes up, no, which is joy. And then I say, well, instead of one giant umbrella, imagine many, many, many tiny, tiny umbrellas that happen to be made of small of sulfur, which becomes sulfuric acid droplets that block off some of the sunlight, cooling down the planet. And this is doable, it's affordable, it's now being funded, and it can get done in your lifetime and in your name. When I said that, the engagement stayed high, but the joy went down. <laughs> so I had them. They were like, holy smokes. But look at how the joy came back, because there was an atmosphere of engagement, etc. And one of the kids from former Yugoslavia made a remark that I couldn't understand. And he said it again, and I still couldn't understand. So you see engagement going down. And then we got it. Oh, sorry, I wasn't showing you the, the photos. So that's when he was. Uh, when I was saying, yeah, geoengineering, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's when I said, imagine giant umbrella. That's very popular. Yeah? Kid from Guatemala listening to delivery manipulation of the global climate. Now, the kid who was saying something, he was saying about the sulfuric acid droplets, it's like having nano umbrellas. He made a joke. That's the most obvious crystallization of understanding. Yeah? So I am now over convinced that yes, humor can help me accomplish the serious things I have to accomplish, that we have data to back it up, and it's a good idea to work with Drew, Belina, Bob, Zohar, and all these awesome people. And I love Mary Poppins. No. <laughs> that has not changed, but it's OK. I'm still willing to work with people I don't know. Uh, so we did a survey. Uh, in short, was there too much humor or too little humor? And most people said there was exactly the right amount of humor. And then we asked, was there more than usual, less than usual, about as much as usual? They said, much more than usual. The logical conclusion is that more humor than usual is exactly the right amount of humor. <laughs> Math geeks of the world unite. So, fun is functional. Fun can help us get serious work done. And this is, I think, my last slide, so I should be on time, uh, Madam uh, Time Checker. Why does humor work? Let's first think about why the usual things don't work. Why were those people so bored in that conference photo? Because we're giving answers, and no one has that question. <laughs> humor usually works a bit like a plug improvisation by creating an instance that is puzzling or confusing. Huh? What giant umbrella in the sky? You need to create an anomaly. You need to create all the words in that word cloud. Tension, confusion, puzzlement, incongruity, ambiguity. And then some input is provided either by use of a joke or preferably by a dynamic that you enable to emerge from the group that leads them to, <laughs> to experience 
a release of that confusion, a something that works, that is entertaining, that is humorous, and if it is well designed, aha, I get it. I have to stop honking again. Yeah, the, the cliff of the waterfall is getting too close. We've got to talk. Whatever the thing may be, we need to get to that aha. So my invitation to you is how can we work together? We are full of problems. You're full of activities, mindsets, exercises that create interaction, that elicit humor. But as far as I know, we could do more to craft the use of humor for having difficult conversations. Most of your work, it's telling me I have to stop in 30 seconds. Perfect. Most of your work is for clients who already have you to do trainings, etc. Not much of your work is about having difficult conversations. And a lot of the humanitarian work we confront needs to address difficult conversations. You can help us, we can help you. Thank you so much for the